know there's a lot of conversation when it comes to founders, founding team being diverse, but there's a lot of questions still needs to be asked when it comes to diversity in BC. So our next um, speakers are going to share with you their insights and their opinions on that and how they are changing um, the VC world and bringing diversity to it. Um, so our first person that's coming up on stage is Lo Tony. He is a founder and managing partner of Plaxo Capital. And Plaxo Capital, an idea behind it is to bring the diversity into the VC world. And our moderator for the talk is Rana Gujral. He's an entrepreneur and investor. Uh, he's been advising several startups, and he's also an active angel investors. And in 2017, he was named uh, one of the top 10 entrepreneurs to follow by Huffington Post. So if you can please give them a warm welcome, Lo and Rana. All right. Great. Good to see you here, Lo. Thank you. All right, so um, we're gonna talk about a bunch of things, but uh, first out of the, the you know the rumors on the street, we start with that first. Uh, so you know you were with uh, GV, but uh, apparently uh, there's a talk about you spinning off a new fund, uh, focusing on diversity and investing in seed funds led by people of color and women, um, and uh, raised close to 50 million. True. I cannot comment, but uh, that is a good overview. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let's start with that, right? So um, we all we all get to see a lot of stats uh, on, and data on diversity um, and um, you know or a lack thereof. Um, but what we don't get to see or we don't get to talk about much is why is it important, right? So let's start with that. I mean, so why do you think? It's important to have diversity, especially in venture firms and venture capital or access to capital. I think that when you look at the, the business side of the equation, the ability to be able to incorporate diversity into strategies, we know that based on data, a lot of folks have done data, probably some of the most widely cited is from uh, McKinsey around the effectiveness of companies. I think theirs was focused more on large public companies, but the data shows that when you have a diverse group of um, executives, a diverse board, that the performance of a company is better. So there's a business case to be made that, that's tough to argue with based on the data. I think also if you think about the changing demographics that we're seeing, the United States um, by the year 2040 or so is going to change from, uh, it's changed into a majority minority um, country. I mean, we've already seen certain states flip, like California. So the ability to be able to have a, a representation of employees that are the composition, or reflective of the composition of your target markets is very important. <coughs> There's one thing that, that we've learned as investors that, that is also really interesting. So it's, it's this thought around and then if you think about it from the perspective of, of investors, we noticed when I was at GV that as we were trying to get additional deal flow, yeah. that people of color and women have an indirect or a non-traditional path to venture. Mm -hmm. And therefore, as a result, they pick up these really unique networks, number one. And then number two, they also have a, a really interesting perspective or lens to be able to apply to certain opportunities. Mm -hmm. And at the seed stage, that's important because the ability to be able to find something that not a lot of folks are trying to go after to price it up, to allow a point of entry on the investing side that allows for a nice return, um, but also the ability to have insight into a market based on familiarity before there's an abundance of data um, can lead to a nice return if it's something that's not obvious to, to mainstream Sand Hill Road. Yeah. So based on that insight, um, you know, GV partnered with a lot of these seed stage funds led by a woman or a person of color, mm -hmm. and then as a result was able to successfully get deal flow mm -hmm. that was put into the pipeline for consideration by G, which invests downstream from right. seed investors. Mm -hmm. So there, there's, without question, in addition to 
I think, some important societal mm -hmm. issues that are addressed with increasing diversity in the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe leading is the ability to recognize there's an important business case to be made as well. Yeah, I think that's a good point because it's not, it's not just a view of it's the right thing to do, it actually offers you a competitive advantage. That's right. Um, and if you um, ignore it, you're really losing that advantage. That's 100% that's correct. Yeah. I, mean, I can think of so many different examples mm -hmm. that are um, companies that are very successful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll give one quick example. Yeah. There's a company called Maven. And Maven is, was founded by an entrepreneur named Deshaun Amara. He grew up in Oakland. Um, I grew up in Oakland. Yeah. He went to Hampton University. I went to Hampton University. Wow. Um, and he had this insight around hair extensions for women. Hair extensions are a fixture in the African American community, but more recently there's been a lot of crossover into other ethnicities as well. Right. So he taught himself Mandarin to go to China to be able to go directly to the sources. The main sources for hair extensions are um, China, India, and Brazil. Right. Um, if you just think about like, you know, you need a lot of hair, it has to be kind of straight, able to be bleached, with right. a myriad of different colors. So he went to China, negotiated with suppliers. Um, was able to cut out the you know the people that distribute it and then what he did is in the african-american communities most people get their hair extensions from a beauty supply store so the stylists send their customers to a beauty yeah. supply store and then the customer buys the hair brings it back the stylist installs it the stylist doesn't see any economics as a result of that mm -hmm. so what this deshaun did is he created an app to be able to allow the stylist to show their customers on their iPhone or iPad all, um, you know, many more different styles, kind of like the Amazon endless inventory model. And then he, since he got better economics by removing two pieces out of the supply chain, right. the distributors and the beauty supply stores, yeah. he was able to share the economics with the stylist. So now the stylists have an incentive right. to use his product and they're making more money. So there's a little bit of societal good is there as yeah. well because the stylists now make more money. Yeah. So he took that model up and down Sand Hill Road and he and I talked about this one day. We sat down at um, Phil's Coffee and then ended up at the Battery for four hours talking about this. He was literally laughed out of the offices of a lot of the you know prominent Sand Hill Road firms that invest at seed. And, um, but he was able to, um, you know, there's a, a couple of African American funds, Eric Moore at base, um, um, a core innovation capital, uh, a lady named Cat, mm -hmm. and he was able to raise his seed around from them. I'm an investor as well, personal investor. And then, you know, along comes Ben Horowitz from Andreessen Horowitz. You know, Ben, for those who don't know, grew up in Berkeley, California. Ben is married to an African American woman. And uh, so he, he got the market. So when he saw that, he was like, oh, this is amazing. I'm in. Right. And so then, just like the livings right. that we are, right. all the VCs that laughed Deshaun out of the office, no, Deshaun, but that's right. the deal too. You know? And Deshaun was like, but you laughed at me. Yeah, but we never said no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, just was happening now. Exactly. Um, so the company's yeah. doing very well. And, um, you know, it's just one example of kind of just having that insight into the market to understand right. the opportunity. You know, I, I met a very interesting entrepreneur and investor lately uh, on my recent trip to Tel Aviv. I just came back. And one of the things uh, she told me is that she, as an investor, and I'm an investor myself, that you're taught to recognize patterns and connect dots mm -hmm. and, and look at repeatable metrics uh, which lead to a certain result. And the problem is that the lack of diversity and the lack of engagement from people of color and uh, women in tech scenes and startups and venture sort of eliminate them from that, that, those, those patterns. And as a result, I mean, so it's sort of like it's a vicious cycle, yeah, right? And true. so um, even when you are um, a seasoned investor and you could potentially be a woman yourself, uh, you could be a general partner who's a woman, and, but you're now looking at patterns which don't involve those constituents. Um, and so as a result, you, you feel that, that those option, opportunities are less likely for, to be successful. So I think, I think that's the sort of like, you know, so if someone has to start something, and I think that's why, I know you can't talk about it, but, but I think, you know, that sort of seems like a great bold step. Uh, I mean, without those bold steps, um, that, that logjam can't be removed. So I'm really excited about that. Um, before we go on to the next one, I want to talk a little bit about 
you know, so general uh, G uh, GV and you know may want to or may not want to go into too much into Plexo, but are there any particular aspects you want to call out and say, okay, well, here's how we offer a unique or a disproportionate uh, proportionate value uh, to, uh, you know, based on sort of how we operate as a fund or how we function as a firm? Um, any, anything that calls out? Sure, I'll definitely do the quick elevator pitch on GV. Mm -hmm. So GV is the early stage investing unit for Alphabet, the holding company for Google. GV, formerly Google Ventures, um, boy, at this stage, you know, well over four billion in assets under management and about 400 plus active portfolio companies. Unlike most corporate venture units, GV thinks and compares itself to and behaves more like a traditional financially focused venture fund like an Andreessen Horowitz, uh, Benchmark, KP, um, Sequoia, as opposed to, you know, Intel Capital, Salesforce, or like a GE Ventures where the objective for those units are to identify opportunities that align back with the mothership, maybe fill the product gap or give access to a new technology or provide some partnering early that allows them to be in pole position for a downstream <coughs> in uh, So GV is focused mainly on investing just like a normal Sand Hill Road fund. Invest typically Series A, like <coughs> Yeah. exceptions and some of those have been in the news lately um, and it has a unique structure so it's an operating partner model so 70 employees approximately um, with about 17 investing partners and about 45 operating partners so partners that have vertical expertise functionally in areas like product engineering marketing <coughs> Yeah. A lot of different things that if you think about an entrepreneur and what they face on a daily basis at the board meetings and you know if there's certain financing events or MA events or big partnerships and that's when or strategy things that the investor typically gets involved. But having an operating partner model allows us to help the entrepreneurs with things they face on a more daily basis or a cadence of, of uh, increased frequency. So things such as, hey, I gotta hire a lead engineer. I've got to prioritize my product roadmap, or I need to think about how I'm going to rebrand our, our website and, and mobile app. Um, so it allows us to have a unique value proposition in addition to, to actually financing the companies. Um, so I think that's, that's very additive. I mean, we also have expertise in design, uh, and a lot of entrepreneurs have called that out, that we've helped them think through their information architecture, their user experience, um, their branding, their pricing models, things, things of that nature. Yeah. So I think that's a unique way to be able to differentiate dollars yeah. in, in a very competitive market. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I think uh, what you alluded to with Plexo Capital, I mean, that is true. And what what we're trying to do is to really leverage these unique networks mm -hmm. and insights that people of color and women have who lead seed stage funds mm -hmm. to allow us to not only invest into them to generate returns, but then also in parallel to invest in some of the best companies that come out of their portfolios as well. And the goal is to be able to have a, a unique LP base for Plexo Capital that can augment the value that those GPs we've invested into are providing and give kind of a different vector of value so that we can build a relationship with directly right. with the entrepreneur um, to then hopefully get a direct allocation right next to round of funding. Right. Great. So I'm going to pivot a little bit. Sure. So, so you know, keeping keeping the topic of diversity right. alive. But uh, so we, what we all know. I mean, I think it's obvious that um, there's just aren't enough uh, people of color and women in tech and startups. But uh, certainly, uh, there's a raised awareness, mm -hmm. and um, we have the knowledge, at least, and sensitivities around it. And in light of that, there's a lot of movements happening lately. Me Too, big, big movement. And in light of that, um, MBCA has recently updated its code of conduct, and uh, you know that's been very well publicized. And so, I, you know, as a as a venture capitalist yourself, I would love to understand from you, uh, you know, well, maybe if you could help us understand and really, so for what are the big takeaways from those uh, that that policy update and. What's, what's sort of the response been, uh, maybe a GV, but also in the venture capitalist community around some of those policies that have come out? 
Well, I think at, at GV, you know, what I can say is that we're looking to, to fund the, the best entrepreneurs possible, mm -hmm. and we recognized early that casting a wider net is a good thing, which is why we partnered with a lot of the seed stage funds led by a woman or a person of color. We knew that we didn't have access to all the networks that were going to generate interesting deal flow, and closed networks don't have a monopoly mm -hmm. on access to the best deals. I think that a lot of the narrative that we're seeing today is very positive. I think you know, within the last, I don't know, within the last month and a half or two months, we've seen NEA announce a new female partner. Yeah. Um, Lightspeed. Lightspeed. First round. It'd be Greylock. Greylock. Oh, this yes. One more. Um, um, well, GB. <laughs> we got Jess really back from uh, from Twitter. There you go. So there you go. So that's at least five, right. uh, if not more. I think I would also like to see you know people of color, particularly underrepresented minorities, mm -hmm. added into that. But to answer your question, I believe that because of the narrative, we are seeing an increased focus right now on how we can diversify mm -hmm. our industry, which is a good thing. Again, mm -hmm. I go back to the business portion, which is mm -hmm. you know you get into new networks that way. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing, and I, I've, I've heard this anecdotally, that a lot of entrepreneurs are looking at the, the composition of the makeup of the partnership to really determine whether or not that's the type of fund that they want to work with. Mm -hmm. Does that fund reflect the values of mm -hmm. females or people of color as they're trying to build a certain type of organization? Mm -hmm. Typically, you want to align yourself with people that have similar values, mm -hmm. and if you're looking at a funder that um, only is, you know, is one-dimensional in terms of the composition of his team. I mean, that might not be the best partner. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that definitely is the case. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited about it because I believe that you know, it's, it's past due for our, yeah. our industry and uh, you know, it just leads to better business returns. It's just good business. Yeah, it makes better business sense. I mean, that, like, that point can't be understated. Exactly. Um, when you align incentives, um, I mean, it should make sense to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, on that point, right, so there was a recent talk, uh, Samuel Shah had um, done this talk about uh, availability of capital mm -hmm. and sort of a comparison between seed and uh, A, and certainly the point that was, well, it's especially lately, like 2017, you know, early 2018. Um, there's been a lot of capital floating around, and uh, it's been easy to raise a seed round. But for an exception, uh, is uh, for the URMs or the underrepresented minorities, uh, that's not the case. Um, you know, what, if you could talk a little bit about sort of like you know, do you really feel that there is actually a climate that uh, sort of uh, you know prevents the URMs to benefit from this availability, and why is that? Um, yeah, so definitely, based on the numbers, we know that that's mm -hmm. true, right? Because yeah. we don't see the numbers reflecting the, the demographics. Yeah. So what I can say is that, in particular, going back to the thought around networks, a lot of people that are starting companies mm -hmm. uh, who are URN females, I mean, they don't, they don't necessarily have access mm -hmm. to being one degree removed mm -hmm. from someone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I can own... I can't even begin to say how many inbounds I receive over the transom, whether it be Twitter, it's mainly LinkedIn, um, every now and then it's Instagram, believe it or not. Yeah. Not the best way to contact me. The younger crowd. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've even gotten a couple of texts, which yeah. is pretty scary. Um, but you know, folks don't have access to the networks, and yeah. so I always, I try, I do my best. Right. I, did, I did it a lot better before I got to GV, but I do my best to try and help be helpful, um, and just even just responding. So even if it's a no, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll get, I'll say, yeah, it's not a good fit for us. Why don't you look at this fund, or why don't you check out Crunchbase and do this type of search? Uh, and people are just so grateful that I'm even just responding because they don't have access and they're spraying and praying um, without success, of right. course. So, I mean, that's one thing. When yeah. you think about the way that investors receive access to most deals, I mean, we, we go hunt. So if we have a particular investment thesis, we'll go hunt and try and identify entrepreneurs that fit within that thesis. Mm -hmm. 
whether that be at conferences or whether we might see an article and then we'll reach out. Mm -hmm. But as I'm sure you're aware, as everyone in this room is aware, this is a relationship business. So it is. the majority of the, the deals, um, they are you know typically referred in, whether that be from an entrepreneur that we've worked with in the past, which is actually the best source of deals. It's, awesome. it's amazing right. how Entrepreneurs just have that ability to be able to sniff out someone that has similar characteristics to themselves. Right. So that's typically the best source of deal flow. An entrepreneur right. that we've backed before, or uh, an entrepreneur that sometimes we passed on, but we right. a close relationship. Right. right. Well, that was the whole pattern of recommendation I was talking about. So that's where we, the logjam needs, needs to be broken because it is looking for that pattern it that is. you're comfortable with, yeah. and that includes the people you funded before. Yeah, and you know, here's the thing, I. You know, I have received referrals from white male entrepreneurs for URM and female. Uh, and so then it's a question of, is the entrepreneur able to get to the person who's close to me, who I trust? Mm -hmm. And so that's where I see the challenge, is just because a lot of these folks just are not in those networks. You know, now some are, right? So, you know, I've seen, you know, the, the uh, I'm working on a deal right now, it's led by an African-American woman, and she came out of a well-known Silicon Valley startup. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she, she knows all the right people right. and was able to, to get to me. Um, so, you know, there are those yeah. edge cases, okay. but, you know, again, kind of if you think about how these things work and what that pattern recognition looks like, and we're talking about right now, the prototypical model is someone that was maybe leading product or business development or engineering team at a well-known Google, Facebook, Twitter, or an Airbnb, you know, Uber, Lyft, yeah. um, um, you know, one of those, you yeah. know, Slack, right? Yeah. So you have to kind of be in there. And then we also know that the numbers for those companies are all, for the most part, sure. at a sub 10% sure. in terms of URM, and you know, females are a little bit better, but not much, yeah. right? So if, if the pattern recognition today for the prototypical model is a PM out of Facebook, Right. How many URM PMs are there at Facebook? I know right. one. Yeah. And actually, I know two. Mm -hmm. I know two. So That's pretty stark. Yeah. So you're not just yeah. you're just not going to see that that deal flow. Or right. you you know you've got an entrepreneur from Cincinnati, Ohio, who's right. working on something. Um, and you know how are they going to get to me? Well, they're probably going to reach out on LinkedIn because right. they just are not one degree removed from my my network. Me, low Tony, me or me. A, a VC at a you know a top tier fund. Sure. You know, uh, good, great points there. So I mean, we should talk about stats a little bit because they're very very stark and real. Mm -hmm. um, so the Information Magazine recently published their Future Health Study, and they, were, they conducted it well. You know, in, in, with uh, social capital yep. and diversity at VC, and they found that 92% of the senior investors in the top tier firms are male mm -hmm. and 78% are white. And they also found that almost 25% um, have all white male managers, all, I mean mm -hmm. in entirety. And um, I mean it's pretty stark, I mean this is 2018. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you had a chance to read this study or not, but uh, were you, well, I mean, number one, uh, were you surprised? Uh, and do you think things have changed over the last few years uh, much at all? Um, and I want to talk about your personal side, because, you know, you're pretty unique. I mean, you know, as your personal experience as a person of color to enter a very white male dominated industry, what, what are your perspectives on the stats and if things are changing at all? So, I'm again, I grew up in Oakland. Um, only child to a single parent mother. Uh, went to a historically black college, Hampton University, mm -hmm. and I went to Cal for, for business school. And when I was at Cal, uh, I learned about venture capital because I was fortunate enough to go to a, a school where VCs came in. I didn't really know a lot about VC, even though I was interested in tech. And I was eager beaver and went up to them and said, hey, how do I, how do I become like you? And, um, and, and by the way, it was all to my recollection, it was all white male VCs that came through in my two years there. Um, and they told me, hey, you know, why don't you go be a PM? Um, because if you're a product manager, that's, that playbook is basically the same playbook as early stage VC, which yeah. is true. Um, that was sage advice from a long time ago before it was 
PM with a du jour choice mm -hmm. for venture capital. Mm -hmm. um, go run a, a big P&L if you can, mm -hmm. uh, and then go be a, a CEO of a venture back company. Mm -hmm. And so I set out to do those things. But while I was still at Cal, that was great advice, by the way. It was very good yeah. advice. It was very. I was. I was. I was lucky. Mm -hmm. I was lucky. And one of the things I would do is I would just go and look at the websites of all the different venture funds. And you know, I was hard pressed to see at that time in particular to see anyone that wasn't a white male that went to Harvard or Stanford. You know, had like the NYU Chicago sprinkled in there yeah. now and then. But for the most part, that was the industry. I mean, it didn't deter me. I just because you know, as 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 a as a person of color, as a black man, I mean, that's been my life, my whole life. Right? I've always been like the only one, mm -hmm. you know, or one of two. So, I mean, it, you know, it's it's the reality. Things have changed a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, I, I see glimmers of hope generationally. Like I look at the generation ahead of me right. and my mentor, you know, and he was, has always been the only one. And look at my generation, there's a few more. But then I have hope for the generation behind me because now when I go, now that I'm graybeard, I go to these conferences and uh, or silver fox. <laughs> <laughs> when I go to these conferences, what I see is I see way more diversity than I've ever seen before. Yeah. Particularly when I go to Los Angeles or New York, um, both in terms of people of color and women. So I have glimmers of hope behind me that, and, and I think there's more awareness now Definitely. within our communities. I, yeah, I didn't know sure. about venture capital until right. I got to, to grad school. And, and now I get pinged by um, people that are in undergrad I participated in this program called HBCU VC. Um, so there's much more awareness now. So I'm hopeful for those behind us being able to change. I'm also hopeful for the mindset more broadly within the generations behind us of being more open and accepting. Totally. A lot to hope for. Yes. Yeah, very exciting. We could talk all day. We could. But the timer's at zero. All right. So we're going to end. Uh, but awesome. Thank you. All right.